that uh, uh, in one case, recently, we had $27 million in cash that was found shrink-wrapped in a warehouse east of uh, Colorado Springs. If you were missing 27 million, will you be concerned? But there it was, it was shrink wrapped, ready to be sent down to Mexico. The amount of crime, the amount of drugs is tremendous that, that uh, comes through our community. It is estimated that roughly 60% of everything that comes up from Mexico comes through Denver. 60, 60% of drugs and contraband. Sheer fact of geography, it comes through the airport, less, less so, mostly it comes up the I-25 corridor, as the state patrol has increased its enforcement, it comes up the other corridors of the state, the north-south corridors. We are a tremendous transshipment point for narcotics and drugs, for New York, Chicago, for the East Coast, and the Central Midwest. And, and so our crime, we see the symptoms of our crime in the kinds of murders and the violence, the killing of witnesses. That is a symptom of these very large criminal organizations that can afford to have $27 million in cash in a warehouse ready to ship down to Mexico. Uh, in, in just one example. Next slide. Keep going. All right, case where we had uh, found lots of, of methamphetamine uh, in, a, in a child's Elmo doll uh, up in Greeley. By the way, the most popular uh, case ever on the DEA's website. Uh, people have been fascinated by this whole Elmo concept. Next slide. Keep going through these slides here. All right. We're gonna keep going. We're a bank. How many people knew we're top five in the nation for bank robberies? People think bank robberies are done. I was surprised to find in joining the office, we do about 100 bank robbery prosecutions a year. And it's, it's, it's interesting how in our part of the world, we spend yet more resources on traditional crimes like bank robbery when we have, as with this slide, cases that are increasingly taking us overseas, fighting for the same budget. We had a case that's gotten a lot of international attention called the Zydeus case. Zydeus uh, is a great example. How many of you have gotten uh, any kind of a spam or internet message trying to come on guys fess up for Viagra Cialis? How many of you say like, your life is gonna improve, this is great, all right. Um, this happened in Colorado and lots of folks, we started to see people showing up in emergency rooms, Longmont, Loveland, they were suffering symptoms consistent with an overdose of a schizophrenia drug called Haldol, which a lot of people wouldn't think to take unless you have schizophrenia. And people who were otherwise healthy, middle-aged men, were showing up with this Haldol overdose. And it turned out that people were buying a drug over the internet that they thought was a Cialis tab that was actually coming out of a factory in China. Uh, they were buying it over the internet without a prescription and it was the drug Haldol, and that's what people were buying. Now, just as an aside, that's a picture of the envelope that one of the people got their drug in. The drug comes in a plain Ziploc bag, and then you get kind of a hand magic marker with the stamps stuck on it to come to your house. If you're ordering pharmaceuticals over the internet, and I encourage you not to do so, please don't, if you get something like that, and somebody's like hand inked and out, please do not take that drug. I was astonished to find out how many hundreds of people were showing up sick around the state because they were ordering off a spam message. When that happened, and this I think illustrates the point of the internationalization of crime, when that happened, we began to trace the source of supply. It turned out that the key informant was sitting in a Chinese prison, a prison run by the People's Liberation Military. And so we actually had to figure out a way to send agents from Denver and an assistant U.S. attorney to go interview. They did an interview in the prison. It turned out, leading us to this fellow Zydeus, a Greek national, he was having the drug produced in China. He was having it shipped in drop shipments. Big packages would come in through different channels to Panama. And then in Panama, they would find a way to get it into the U.S. Uh, through other means. So there was no tracing. And every part of the operation is designed so if you take it down, you know, there's no hope of being able to, uh, to, to get the big fish. He, he made a couple mistakes and he was picked up and ultimately extradited to the United States. But imagine what it's like when you're trying to deal with, you know, you're a bank robbery capital, you've got a very underserved state and you're trying to deal with a case like Zydeus. You're trying to figure out how to send agents over to a foreign country, different language, deal with the Chinese military to get access to the prison. That's the reality of Colorado law enforcement today and what we deal with. Next slide. 
Joe Nacho, we mentioned, all I have to say is that he is in prison, folks. He's there. <laughs> he actually recorded, he's serving his sentence. And uh, a lot of people work very hard to make that happen. Uh, as has been publicly reported, uh, his, his, his side spent more than 78 million in legal fees. Um, and it's not over yet. Next slide. Keep going. I just have a couple more slides, uh, Miriam, in the interest of time, because I want to take some questions. So keep going through, I'll show you. Uh, Stop, stop for just a second, go back one. I would be remiss in not talking about child pornography. The fastest growing category of crime in Colorado uh, is internet enabled child pornography. And that is consistent with other states around the country. The essential problem is that, that the internet makes, makes it easier for people to find and trade child porn. Uh, we found it being able to do, oh, okay, this is great. Yeah, it does work now, this is great, thank you. We found it. We, we found in, in being able to, to measure the problem of child porn. We developed a software program through the, the, the FBI, the Secret Service, and uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs, are the main law enforcement agencies that do child porn prosecutions. We actually found a way of being able to map servers where child porn is traded. The way this works is gross to talk about, but as parents, grandparents, you know people aspiring to be parents, we need to talk about this issue to protect our kids. People trade for images of what they have or what they want. There's a whole market in this. You can go to servers on the web if you know where to go and do that kind of trading. We did a test uh, using uh, some law enforcement sensitive technologies that enable you to figure out where people are trading child porn. You can take a known image of a child that you know is illegal. We took images of kids six and younger that were already at the National Center for Missing Exploited Children. We map them, and then you can figure out where the servers are geographically in a, in a given jurisdiction where they're traded. So you can take the state of Colorado and say, we're looking for this image. You can't tell names and addresses of people, but you can tell addresses of computer servers. And we found more than 55,000 servers trading the images that we were looking for. None of the experts had expected more than 500 uh, servers would be trading. That the scale of this problem is, is a vast, vast problem. And so uh, even in quadrupling over the last couple of years, child pornography prosecutions in Colorado, sadly, I don't think we're even beginning to deter this problem. And it takes an increasing share of the law enforcement budget. All right. I'm going to go through this and get to the end here. The other way. Other way. So, well, at least the clicker's working, right? All right. Maybe it's... It's a very weak signal. Um, Miriam, you want to make it make it roll again? Sorry. What really what I want to tell you is that it's, um, it, it's it's an environment that is constantly changing and, and is constantly in flux. And what I want to do is get to the end and talk a little bit about Guantanamo. So thank you for coming back, Miriam. Go all the way to the end. I want to show you something here. I'll show you where to stop. Lots of things we can talk about. Um, I'd love to talk a bit about the DNC, and I know we don't have a lot of time. It was the biggest law enforcement operation ever in, in this part of the world. Um, it, it was a tremendous amount of preparation. The U.S. Attorney's Office is responsible as the lead agency coordinating with the FBI and the Secret Service. Uh, it was an incredible thing to, to be able to, to plan an event and two principles there. One, we have extraordinary expertise in the state, and we had a tolerance in the community for using a very visible display of policing. We used perhaps five times the police presence that was used in St. Paul. You noticed that we had a federal lawsuit over protesters' access to the city. It was the first time in US history that we, 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 we phased the process so the protesters not only had a chance to go to court, but they had a trial. They actually had a trial in front of a judge to say we want to have access to protest on these streets at these times, have this backdrop from our TV, and this is what we've got to do. And you know, they got their trial, we had our court decision, and we were able to then uh, do what we had to do. We didn't have any injuries. Uh, we, we had a relatively small number of arrests. And, and so the message was you can work well with a lot of different jurisdictions. We had more than 200. We had a federal presence that was the largest federal presence by far ever in the state of law enforcement, roughly 17,000 at different points. Uh, different federal officers, agents were involved in some way. And we had nobody, nobody hurt, let alone killed. So 